to a, a new topic. Um, so last week we covered a handful of ways of storing data on disk. Um, this week we're going to move on to how we can actually use that data to do interesting things. Um, so we've gone over various query languages. So now we're going to go over ways of actually evaluating those queries. How, what, are, what are sort of the, the challenges that we need to face in order to actually uh, evaluate a relational database query. So the core concept uh, in this strategy is going to be something called uh, a query plan. And loosely speaking, this is essentially going to be a relational algebra expression. Uh, it's going to be a relational algebra expression organized into a tree with a little bit of extra information sitting on top of it. Uh, so for example, uh, various operators like the join uh, can be implemented in a variety of different ways depending on how the data is structured. So a query plan, uh, to be precise, is a tree of relational operators with a little bit of extra information telling you uh, which algorithm uh, one of each of those operators is going to use. Now the, the general way that most queries tend to be executed is uh, by essentially pulling data out of, uh, out of the query. Um, so Essentially, each, each of these operators is going to read data out of the operators below it. So this is going to create sort of this compositional structure. Um, we'll get to uh, some variations of this basic model later on when we talk about streaming. Now, uh, looking at this from a really, really high level, there are going to be three basic strategies that we're going to use over and over again while evaluating queries. And the first of these is uh, essentially to create some sort of data structure to organize the data that we're looking at. So if we need to compute some value, um, often it's a computation that we're going to have to do over and over and over again. So the, the quickest approach here is to organize uh, the, the data that we're going to need in that computation uh, in some meaningful way that allows us to uh, perform the computation more efficiently. So essentially, that we're going to see a lot of these algorithms that are broken up into two stages. Uh, this organizational step, and then the actual uh, implementation of the algorithm. Um, iteration also plays a big role. So sequential scan uh, databases are still sort of geared very heavily towards uh, sequential scans. And this is incredibly important not just for, um, not just for dealing with hard disks, but also distributed systems, um, where the data comes in sort of uh, slowly and you need to be able to process it relatively uh, quickly as it comes in. Uh, and, and sort of the final strategy that we're going to see uh, occur a couple of times is this idea of partitioning. So main memory is uh, getting bigger and bigger every year. We're seeing more and more of these main memory databases pop up. but uh, hard disks and, and persistent storage is still necessary. Uh, and since we can only do computations on data in RAM, um, one thing that ver uh, occurs very frequently is uh, algorithms that essentially break up the computation into smaller chunks and then evaluate each of those chunks uh, independently. Okay, uh, now to sort of tease you uh, with some stuff we're going to cover uh, in about maybe towards the end of this week. Um, this idea of uh, query plans and, and query execution is tied very closely uh, to the question of what is the most efficient way of running a query. And so I've already hinted that, at this uh, when talking about SQL and relational algebra. Uh, there are many different equivalent ways of phrasing a particular query. And one of the things we'll be focusing on for a good portion of the term uh, is this idea of figuring out which plan is the most efficient. Now, uh, the, the two main questions in, in query optimization are, are sort of which plans to, uh, to consider, and then uh, how do we exactly figure out or, or estimate uh, how much a plan is going, how expensive a, a particular uh, query plan is going to be to run without actually running it. Um, so when I pose this question to you guys, actually, um, how uh, if we have, let's say, uh, a 
whole bunch of different uh, query plans. How would we go about uh, picking which of those to, to possibly? Should we explore all of the, the possible query plans, all of the possibilities uh, for expressing a particular query? Thoughts? So let me uh, amend that a little bit and say that every single decision is going to, there are a huge number of orthogonal decisions that need to be made when uh, considering two different plans. So uh, I've already given you a couple of examples of two different operators that are equivalent. And every single time you see one of those operators, you can always switch it for one of the others. So let's say we have 10 such operators. Uh, how many different possibilities uh, for query plans would we have? Ten, ten operators, either of which can be expressed in two different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, can I get a hand? Two to the ten. Ten twenty-four. Uh, and essentially, as we add more and more of these operators, this gets more and more expensive, and the search space basically just grows exponentially. Um, so perhaps a better question is, can we consider all equivalent plants? And Basically, the short answer is no. So the, the first of these issues is really sort of narrowing down the search space and figuring out uh, how to zoom in on, on the plans that we're, we're specifically looking, uh, looking for. And so uh, practically speaking, we're not actually going to be able to find the best plan, uh, but we can certainly do quite a bit to get reasonably close to the best plan. And we'll be covering uh, approach, sort of the, the most common approach that's used out there at the moment, um, something that was originated, again, I believe in the 80s or so, by a system called System R. Okay, so I've been talking about this I, vague idea of query plans so far. Uh, what exactly is a query plan? Well, uh, let me give you a concrete example. Um, so I have a query here, one that we've seen over and over and over again. Um, Anyone want to read off sort of the relational algebra expression for this? And what do I do? Uh, if we're going to select um, on ships enterprise. Okay, so we're going to have a selection predicate on the ships enterprise. <coughs> the only type of plan 
and used in this system art that we'll be coming back to in a class or two. And I mean, it's simple, but it works surprisingly well uh, as long as you have a relatively small number of joints. Um, basically, the rule of thumb here is about 10. If you have 10 or fewer joints, you're set. Okay, uh, so one other thing, uh, one other little bit of notation here uh, is this idea of uh, iterators. So if you've done any, any sort of uh, programming with uh, Java collections, then you might be uh, fairly familiar with this idea. But essentially the idea is that you have uh, every operator uh, exposes a fairly straightforward um, API. So you can uh, essentially just create the operator and then start reading values out of the operator. Uh, the way this, uh, this sort of helps us is that each operator uh, can sort of, uh, we, can, we can easily connect uh, the various operators together. Um, so every time you do a get next on a selection predicate, for example, it would keep doing a get next on its source of data until you get um, a, a tuple that matches the selection predicate. Uh, so just to make that a little more concrete, uh, how would we go about uh, precisely implementing the selection? Well, uh, straightforward approach is that we simply have this selection predicate look at each tuple as it comes in. Um, any tuple that matches the selection predicate uh, is good, otherwise we just pass it through. Um, right. Now there's... Right. So there's a uh, solution so that's, that's sort of the, the trivial solution to implementing selection. Um, there's, there's a second uh, approach to implementing selection that can be sometimes uh, a bit more efficient. So for example, if you have a bunch of data, you first sort the data. Uh, this is particularly helpful if you have one specific tuple that you're looking for. So you first sort the data if, if it hasn't already been sorted or orga organized, and then you can perform a binary search on all of your data uh, until you actually find the value you're looking for. Um, now, any thoughts on uh, when this might be a particularly uh, better idea than just iterating over the entire screen and picking out the, the tuples that match the selection for idea? Hmm. Well, the search is going to take login steps, but um, you still have to sort the data. So under what conditions would this uh, actually be helpful? So sorting the data is probably going to be more expensive than iterating over the entire data set. Ah, so if the data is already sorted, this actually helps. Yeah, um, basically this, if the data is already organized in some meaningful way, um, and you know that you're looking for only a fixed number of tuples, um, this is actually considerably more efficient. Um, right. Oh. Okay, um, so this this brings me to this idea of materialization. And this is more this is more a, a term than anything else. Um, essentially it's the the idea that at various points in the query plan it may be beneficial to uh, so uh, what I've been describing thus far is, is this idea of reading data in in sort of the streaming manner. So you read a tuple, um, then write a tuple. Read a tuple, write a tuple. Um, uh, at various points in the query plan, it may also be beneficial to uh, materialize the query results, uh, beneficial or necessary. Um, that is to say, take all of the, the tuples and just compute them all and create essentially a big intermediate relation that stores all of the data that, uh, that you're trying that is generated at that point in the query plan. Uh, now, the reason, there's a couple of reasons you might do this. Uh, a file, for example, would already be materialized. Uh, but there's also certain operators that uh, require this. So for example, uh, one, one good example of this is sorting. Uh, you need the entire data set in order to, uh, to properly sort a uh, sort of that data. Um, certain kinds of projection um, are also a good example of this. And we'll get to that in a moment. And of course, there's certain operators that just flat out have to.
to, to generate materialized output. And group by aggregates are, are a great example of that. Uh, or well, really any sort of aggregate. Okay, um, so we've, we've covered selection, and I've, I've sort of hinted at this idea that projection might need to materialize things. Well, the, the sort of naive implementation of projection doesn't. Uh, so we get a big tuple, get rid of the fields we don't need, and well, just keep going. Um, can anyone see a problem with this? We go through every tuple, um, but projection always goes through every tuple. Um, so, what kind of projection is this? We went over two types of selection. Oh, sorry, uh, not selection, um, projection. We went over two types of uh, projection. What kind of uh, collections are we using here? Bags, exactly. So this is uh, bag projection. Um, to implement set projection, what do we need to do? Unique, exactly, or distinct. Uh, so this distinct operation can also be um, one of these, these operators. Um, so for example, we can have, uh, we can implement distinct uh, using sort. And any thoughts on how we might do that? So let's see, we have this list of, of, uh, of values, and we need to get only the distinct values. Uh, how would sorting the, the results help us? Hmm? Uh, say that again? Sort the array and then find compare the ones with the Exactly. So we sort the array, and then we can simply scan for uh, duplicates, and all of the duplicates, because the values are sorted, are guaranteed to be adjacent to one another. Uh, now, as it turns out, this uh, required basically two steps. It requires the sort step to organize the data in, in uh, this useful way, and then the, the sort of duplicate elimination is something we can do uh, pretty, pretty much automatically. Um, so the benefit here is that if, if the data already happens to be sorted, then uh, this is an incredibly efficient way of, of just doing duplicate elimination. Okay, uh, so uh, show of hands, who, who here knows what a hash function is? Okay, a couple of people kind of nodding their heads. Um, okay, so Loosely speaking, a hash function is, is just a function that takes a big data value and compresses it into something with fixed size, something that lets us organize that data. Um, typically, this is a deterministic process. If you take one value and, and hash it, you will always get the same value. And it's also generally supposed to be pseudo-random. Uh, that is to say that the value you get is uh, more or less going to be randomly distributed uh, the space of possible values. This is used all over the place. Um, and most commonly, perhaps, in uh, this idea of a, a hash table. Um, so another way of implementing the distinct operator is simply to use a hash table uh, that allows us to very quickly identify which duplicates are uh, of your kinds. Now, something I've been sort of glossing over is uh, memory. So uh, most of you are probably, uh, show of hands, uh, who, who has encountered at the very least uh, sorts in, in memory? I'm, I'm hoping most of the class will raise their hand here. Just regular sorts. Okay, good, I don't have to go over that. Um, a hash table is a little bit more, more tricky, but a, a sort happens entirely, uh, should happen in general entirely in memory. Uh, we'll be going over uh, a version of uh, sorts that can be done using um, when the data it exceeds the amount of memory that you have. But a hash table is actually fairly trivial. Um, what happens if the hash table exceeds the size of memory? What happens if you need more space for this hash table uh, than you actually have in memory? Can I get a hand? Don't get a hand that will randomly call on people. External 
three. Okay. Um, how, can you be more precise? Okay, yeah. Well, 
That depends. Uh, so we're going, the innermost portion of the loop is going to be executed how many times? A times B. And that's going to be probably the most expensive uh, step in this operation. Um, but, uh, so what happens if some of this doesn't fit in memory? What happens, let's say, if B doesn't fit in memory? Let's say we have to split B across two pages. Uh, to, we, we can only fit half of B in memory at any given time. There will be a lot of paging. To be precise, how many, how many times will we need to page if we can only fit half of B in memory? Sorry? And, so how many times do we need to scan through B? Eight times, or a size of eight times. Uh, and how many times? How many pages do we need to do for, for a single scan? Two. Two. So, how many total pages? Two times the size of A. Okay, so that's uh, that's generally a bad thing. Uh, so, what we want to do is make things a little bit more efficient. Um, so, <coughs> if, if the entire relation doesn't fit memory, or if either of the, the relations doesn't fit what we can do is partition the, the relations into smaller blocks. And then essentially perform a nested loop over each pair of blocks. Um, does everyone get this basic idea? Uh, you first compute, uh, first load this into memory, load this block into memory, perform a nested loop join between these guys, flush this, load this, perform a nested loop join between those, and then flush this, load this, load this, nested loop, nested loop. Um, how many IOs is this going to require? Or let's say each of those boxes is one, uh, one page. Three. Three. So that'll be, well, it needs at least four because we have to load every one of them at least once. Uh, so each of them has to be loaded at least once, if they're all on disk. But then on top... Uh, it would be three because uh, once we have loaded B, we will not load, like suppose that is B1, that is B2, we will not load B1 again, when we are loading A2. Well, let's say we you don't have enough memory to fit everything in. You can, uh, one other way of thinking it is that this isn't necessarily a, a block on disk or a page on disk, but uh, a fragment of or a fragment of view. Um, maybe this is five gigabytes of okay. um, So you, the, the point is basically that you don't necessarily need, uh, the, the boundaries here don't necessarily need to be um, individual blocks. You might load a whole bunch of blocks into memory at once and then perform a, a nested loop join on, on each of the, uh, on as much as you can fit in memory. Okay. Are there questions on this? Uh, so let's say, yeah, so we could potentially split, uh, split um, B into two parts. So maybe this is actually one block, but it could also just as easily be uh, 10 blocks or uh, 100 blocks. Just whatever we can fit into memory, load that in and then do a nested load nested loop join with whatever we can load in from A and then we sort of break it up into smaller blocks. So I've got to it since we have in the and the yeah so at any at any given point in time we have one one of the the big segments of A and one of the segments of B. I, yeah I should be calling these segments, although it's generally referred to as block nested loop join. It would be five times. Five times. So we start with one, two, those are now loaded into memory. Now we need to flush this, get, get rid of it in memory, and load this. So that's three so far. Then we need, oh, as you keep this one, and, okay, uh, yeah, sure. 
that is that is a nice optimization on here. Um, rarely will that actually be done in a database system, just because these tend to be so. You end up with so many of these blocks that it's not going to make a huge difference. But yeah, that's that's a good point. So you can get away with just by it. Okay. Um, one other join I'm going to skip for the time being and get back to once we cover indices uh, is that we can actually use uh, an index as part of the join uh, to make computing the join much faster. Um, I'm going to skip that for now and then move on to what's called a sort merge join. Um, so anyone who's implemented uh, merge sort uh, should be fairly familiar with this. Um, so let's say we have two relations and those relations just happen to be already in sorted order. Uh, how, uh, so show of hands, uh, merge sort, good, great, that's pretty sure everyone. Um, okay, so this is essentially merge sort. Uh, we have two sorted lists, we need to sort them together. And what's a very nice property of this? Uh, so we start at the top, we, we merge them, uh, we join the first two tuples together if, if possible, then we keep iterating down the list uh, until we find a match, and uh, just stepping onto whatever is the, the lowest, uh, the next lowest value, and every time we find a match, we, um, we release a tuple. Uh, what's a, what is a nice uh, property of this? So how many times do we need to, uh, well first off, how much of each of these are we required, uh, of each of the relations are we required to look at at any given point in time? How much memory are we consuming as part of this join? Two, two tuples. Yes, exactly. So well, two, three, but essentially a constant number of tuples. Uh, this is what's known as a, a string <coughs> number, which is to say it's, uh, it, we can, we can just scan over the data once and get all of the outputs that way. Uh, so this is really nice in that sense. Uh, but what is the downside? The data has to be sorted exactly. Uh, so we end up with this nice little trade-off. Sometimes it actually makes sense to sort the data so you can, uh, just so you can do a sort version. Okay, uh, two more of these, these join algorithms. And the first is um, the first is a simple hash join. The idea here is that we don't necessarily have enough space uh, in memory to do everything. Uh, so we're going to take our two relations and we're going to use a hash function to distribute them into various hash buckets as per a normal uh, hash table. So we scan one of them, build half of the hash table. We scan the other one, build the other half of the hash table. And now we can iterate over this hash table to find all of the, sorry, sorry that should say loop. <coughs> no, that is, uh, we do a nested loop join on essentially each bucket because we're pretty much guaranteed that each, or a, a good chunk of each hash bucket uh, can be, uh, will fit in memory. Uh, if it turns out that a hash bucket doesn't fit in memory, uh, we might need to, um, we might need to subdivide it further. Get back to that next week. No, sorry, we'll get back to that on Wednesday. Um, now, what's let's say that the B side of this relation fits in memory. Yes. How will how will be the like there's an element from A and another element from B. They both are suppose that both are being mapped into the same value in the hash. So we essentially keep two linked lists for each hash bucket. One for the relations of A, one for, sorry, one for the tuples of A, one for the tuples of B. Why don't we use a single linked list? Uh, because we need to, dis well, we could use a single linked list, but either way we'd need to distinguish between which tuples belong to A and which tuples belong to B, because we need to do a nested loop join over every single hash bucket. Uh, we might end up with multiple tuples in A that join with a single tuple. When we are creating this hash table, then are we, uh, will this be persistent? 
exactly once. Yeah, so you can stream over the tuples in B in A. Uh, you still need to uh, repeatedly look at multiple tuples in B, but you can stream all of the tuples in A. Um, the same holds for the index nest and loop join and uh, the hybrid hash join. Uh, the second question we need to keep in mind is can we keep all of the data in memory? Does the algorithm rely on the data being in memory? Um, and for the case of the nested loop join, I think generally the answer is yes. Uh, for the block nested loop join, which was essentially sort of a, a generalization of the nested loop join uh, that didn't have this requirement, um, the index nested loop join and the hybrid hash, uh, sorry, the hybrid hash join needs to have the, ha the smaller relation in memory. And the sort of merge join might need everything in memory if it needs to sort things. Uh, and finally, the, the final question is whether or not there's any uh, restriction on the predicates, uh, the, the condition, the join condition. Um, so in the case of a nested loop, block nested loop join, there's no such limitation. All you're doing is, is uh, looping. Um, in the case of um, sort merge, hash, and hybrid hash, you're only allowed to use um, equality comparisons. And in the index nested loop join, it's essentially going to be based on the index. We'll get to that when we get to it. All right. Um, I was hoping to get to aggregates today. Um, I don't think we have time for that. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to resume this discussion on Wednesday with aggregates and um, various out of court, uh, various external out of court.